Welcome. Thank you for joining us uh, today. Uh, this event will be recorded and put on our website. So those who can't join us can view it at a later time. We will begin with a period of silence for eight minutes and 46 seconds to honor the memory of George Floyd and other black victims whose lives have been taken by racial injustice.
Thank you. Seeing those faces was very powerful. Uh, today, we are gathered to reflect on the historical legacy of injustice and present violence against black and brown bodies and the realities of systemic racism. We have all witnessed the public lynching of George Floyd and the anger and pain that has resulted. This is an opportunity to reflect and consider. I am particularly grateful to our BLSA students who have organized this event with the assistance of Professor Victoria McCoy Dunkley and Lisa Braithwaite, advisors to BLSA, and Assistant Dean Michelle Harper. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our faculty presenters who have both reflected deeply on matters of race. University Distinguished Professor Patricia Williams and Professor of Law and Biology Jonathan Kahn. After we hear from our faculty, BLSA students will share some thoughts and reflections. Um, Jonathan and I were going to, I suppose, answer questions or talk a little bit with one another. Uh, I am not quite certain um, how to conduct this, but maybe I will speak for just about five minutes and then turn it over to Jonathan. And if there's some questioning or discussion, we can proceed from there. Uh, I think that uh, one of the things that has struck me in the last few days is a pronouncement by the attorney for uh, uh, Officer Chauvin, uh, the man whose knee was placed upon the neck of um, George Floyd, uh, that uh, it wasn't really on his neck <laughs> and it wasn't really asphyxiation. And uh, this echoes the initial medical examiner's report, uh, which read, the autopsy revealed no physical findings that support a diagnosis of traumatic asphyxia or strangulation. Mr. Floyd had underlying health conditions, including coronary artery disease and hypertensive heart disease. The combined effects of Mr. Floyd being restrained by the police, his underlying health conditions and any potential intoxicants in his system likely contributed to his death. And this is an astonishing description. It is a shameful circum circumlocution because of course, George Floyd did die by asphyxiation. And I think one of the things that the attorney has said, Prime Minister Chauvin has said, well, you know, the hyoid bone wasn't broken, uh, which is, which does not understand what a chokehold or a knee upon the neck actually does, which is to apply pressure to the carotid artery and cut off oxygen to the brain, which is what happened in his, in, in Mr. Floyd's case. And the fact that he died by asphyxiation <laughs> is so obvious that the medical examiner's report actually reads like a systemic bureaucratic corruption. And I think that that is the opening to think about this as something indicating more than simply the legal or the lethal indifference of a single, quote, rogue officer. Blaming Floyd's, Floyd's death on underlying health conditions is a remarkably determined deflection of Chauvin's agency. And in the end, of course, as we all know, Floyd's family hired an independent coroner who confirmed lethal asphyxiation. And quickly thereafter, a final report was issued by Minnesota's coroner who logged the official cause of death as strangulation. But this kind of linguistic effacement of agency often directs our gaze in very powerful ways, tells us where to look and where not to. You know, I, I, I often cite in my classes the case of Kajimi Powell, who was a black man with mental health problems. And in 2014, he took snacks from a convenience store and he tossed them onto the street, allegedly brandishing a steak knife. And he called out to the police from quite a distance, shoot me, shoot me, shoot me now. And the police obliged him 12 times over. And the police's actions are explained by what has since become a fairly common appellation suicide by cop. You might have heard that term, or police-assisted suicide. And it's an interesting deployment 
of the passive. It eliminates official responsibility by recasting a trigger-happy officer as the extended will of the deranged, self-sacrificing Mr. Powell. He did it to himself. No one's fault but his own. And I think this is a feature of the trope of black bodies killing themselves. It echoes the degree to which, in fact, higher rates of COVID-19 infections among African Americans are often blamed on biological difference rather than the circumstances of their lives. The toll too frequently referenced as solely the product of comorbidities like obesity, obesity asthma, bad choices, genetic propensity. But poverty creates petri dishes for the virus. Blacks, poor, and the old die at higher rates in America because their social circumstances have ghettoized them into tight, poisoned geographies, kind of like bugs placed in a jar with the caps screwed on tightly. And so as we watch two great tragedies unfold and intertwine before us, the toll of coronavirus and the toll of extrajudicial deaths at the hands of state actors and vigilantes. One maps onto the other in a double helix of grief and despair. Americans are yearning to resolve the incoherence of this moment. And this emotional tinderbox must be read against the backdrop of other events. We respond not merely to the misuse of police power, but also to the bewildering federal mismanagement of life's sustaining resources amidst a global pandemic. We watch the mishandling in every possible way of food distribution, of subsidies and financial assistance, of medical equipment, and of our military forces. And this perfect storm of collective smothering, literally a foot on all our necks, has made the image of George Floyd's death even more exceptionally and spectacularly powerful. It is legible to such a broad political spectrum because of the resonance of I can't breathe makes us cringe with sorrow, induces frightening political constrictions, yet doubles also as coronavirus's power to make its victims literally gasp for breath. And it is such a fragile moment. And perhaps we sit on the razor's edge of real reform, or perhaps we will never find our way out of this linguistic maze that keeps turning the dead into the deadly agents of their own demise. And I'll turn it over to, to Jonathan now. Thanks, Pat. Um, just reflecting on what you just said, um, particularly the, um, the sort of the corruption of the initial autopsy report, um, just came brought to mind actually what I think was a similar kind of um, corruption in the initial charging document from the Hennepin County attorney, um, Mike Freeman, sort of the reluctantly issued uh, initial charge against Chauvin, which for a charging document, in this case, it was initially third degree murder, was again focusing almost gratuitously, but you know, with an underlying, I think, sort of self-subverting purpose on, on the body of George Floyd and implicitly again sort of blaming his body in a similar way. Um, it sort of shows up, this, this, um, this theme shows up in so many, so many places in this and, and the other stories you mentioned. Um, but one thing I wanted to talk about briefly was some thoughts, and again, I, I talked to, the, to Pat about this a little earlier, is my thoughts, um, just sort of general interpretive thoughts in a sense about the distinctive power of the video in this case, and um, in its relationship to the protest that followed. Um, and in particularly um, uh, speaking as a white person and thinking about uh, white people's response, which has been quite remarkable um, to this in contrast to responses of sort of other historical ongoing, always there outrages, right? So it's not like, it's not like what happened to George Floyd was new. Right, this is part of the outrage of it. But I think for a lot of white America, it somehow was. And I think there is something distinctive about the length, the time of the video, and its focus and framing. And what I mean by that, um, for, for a white viewer, 
And what I mean by that is it struck me as, I mean, I, I haven't been able to watch the whole thing in one go. It's just too, it's sort of too much. Um, but um, there is the moment in this long extended video where Chauvin, there's more than one, but there's the moment when Chauvin turns and looks at the camera and you have Chauvin there and you have Floyd there and you have Chauvin looking at you, right? Looking at the viewer while he's doing this with impunity. And my sense is for the white viewer, at that moment, you become Chauvin. Right, Chauvin, that gaze is inviting you into complicity. Right, it is this gaze of complicity. He's inviting you to participate with him, not unlike the way Trump tries to make people complicit in what he's doing in all sorts of ways. And for so long, I mean, a lot of my work has been a critique of the idea of implicit bias, and so for so long. The idea was, oh, everything's implicit, right? But in that gaze, nothing is implicit any longer. And if you're seeing that, again, as a white person, you either consciously, affirmatively have to disown your association. You have to consciously refuse that invitation into complicity. Or else you become Derek Chauvin, right? You become part of that process. So I think the forcing of a confrontation with complicity that had so long been implicit forced a lot of people out into the streets who might not otherwise be there. And I do think this has a potential to sort of change the frame, particularly among sort of, you know, the sort of, uh, you know, well-meaning but ineffectual liberal people who decry racism for generations and nothing ever changed. Well, things change, but right, but the racism persists in profound and deep ways. Um, but for too long, especially over the last couple of decades, um, we've been told, oh, you know, it's just, there's no more racism, it's just implicit bias. And implicit bias is sort of, you know, the, this thing that you just sort of, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's this thing, it's just like any other bias, right? And you realize seeing this, no, it's not, right? So the frame of implicit bias that has been used to talk about so much racist practice over the last couple of decades, um, does this by sort of reducing racism and particularly anti-black racism to just one more sort of cognitive glitch that we have. Um, and it marginalized, it effaced the distinctive history of anti-black racism in this country. And all of that, I think, was forced to the surface by watching this video and realizing there's something distinctive going on here. And we can't talk about it as implicit anymore. Um, and it forced into, again, this visceral visual image of power and dominance. Right? Implicit bias isn't about power and dominance. Racism is. And people realizing that this is about dominance. And this has been Again, think of the, the language that's been used again for people like Trump or Barr um, or um, Tom Cotton, right? About the need to dominate, dominate the streets, this language of dominance and suppression. And, and it really is becoming this, this matter of a, of a choice of, you know, there are these moments in time where it's sort of very much a which side are you on kind of moment. Right. Are you on the, the are you on the side of dominance and racist oppression, or are you standing up against it? And it's not like just off to the side being your implicit self. Um, but I do think it's also worth noting. I, I just say a couple things on this and then sort of open it up. I do think it's worth noting that some real initial and um, significant responses have. Um, happened in response to to the protests. See right here, I'm I am because of uh, a variety of COVID-related matters. I'm actually in Minneapolis. I have been here um, during um, these events, and so I've had you know been covering a lot of uh, reading a lot of the local reporting and engaging a lot of some uh, local um, demonstrations and so forth. But 
I just want to go through some sequential steps of just what's happened here in the last two weeks in response to the protests. First, there's the initial indictment. As grudging as it was, there's an initial indictment in response to the protests. Then there's a removal of the case from the Hennepin County Attorney's Office to the Attorney General's Office. Then there's a raising of the initial charge from third to second degree murder. Then there are charges against the other three officers. The University of Minnesota cuts many of its ties and reconfigures its entire relationship to the Minneapolis Police Force. The Minneapolis Parks Department cuts its ties to the Minneapolis Police Force. Choke holds and neck restraints are banned. And then most recently, a majority of the city council has declared uh, its, um, its intent to seek defunding of the Minneapolis Police Department. Um, those are real things, right? I mean, it's, it's hardly the entire game. It's not like we need to be saying, okay, you know, good, we're done now, because this is a long and it's, an, you know, it's a never ending struggle. Um, but the challenge now is to extend this recognition of complicity of the frame of racism to other areas of society beyond the police. But I think it is powerful and important that it, this sort of the wall of kind of implicit bias, the wall of complicity has been broken in this area, right? People realizing in a sense that they are complicit in these practices, that they are these structural broad problems. So the idea now is carry it forward, right? To other areas. Again, this is why it's a never ending struggle, but you carry it forward too, you know, to housing, to employment, to education, to the environment, to health to all these areas and recognizing, right? This is um, to be in it for the long haul, but to also recognize in the short term, some real progress. Um, because I think it's important to maintain a sense of efficacy, to, even if it's only periodic, right? This sort of turning point, but to maintain a sense of efficacy to sort of to move forward um, or to, and to sustain ourselves um, in this long struggle. So I'll, I'll leave it there. I, I'm not exactly certain yeah. how we're supposed to conduct this or yeah. whether we respond to one another. I just wanted to add one thing to what you said. It, it actually made me re recall that um, since the very beginning of my career, and I began my career in Los Angeles, chokeholds have been banned periodically, as you say. <laughs> um, chokeholds have been banned over and over and over again around the United States um, since the 1970s and 80s. Um, after the death of our Eric Garner, they have been, there has been a great show of, of, of banning them again um, in, city after, in New York City in particular. Um, and I do, I, I'm really concerned that the degree to which a knee on the neck has displaced the arm around the neck in some jurisdictions, yeah. and we don't actually even see it anymore. Because I'm, I'm just thinking, for example, even in the Rodney King case, the beating was what was most prominent in most people's visual recollection. But Officer Bersino in that case actually also did step on Rodney King's neck yeah. um, at one point. And more recently, if you saw two um, images from New York City that came around the time of the police um, handing out masks to white visitors to um, uh, uh, to Central Park, but meanwhile in the East Village, there were two people who were wrestled to the ground and arrested, and there was a very uh, widely circulated image of a man named Donnie Wright who was wrestled to the ground. Um, in both those arrests in the East Village of people of color, the officer, Francisco Garcia, put his knee on their necks, and that's never mentioned. Um, it was, the contrast is made between yeah. how white, uh, uh, non-social distances repeated between uh, and black, but actually, if you rerun those both in both of those instances, um, the same officer put his knee on the neck of both of those arrestees, and ultimately ended up sitting on um, Donnie Wright's um, 
neck and head, and uh, he was hospitalized for uh, spinal injuries as a result. So I think that that unseeing or that failure to see, um, yeah. how, you know, what is routine, and we claim we've banned it. Um, I think, it, but it changes slightly in terms of how it's um, how the you know what part of the body is used to apply to the carotid artery needs to be yeah. um, seen to be. Yeah, and there, there was actually just an article in this morning, Minneapolis Star Tribune, about a case a decade ago. Um, another black man murdered by the police, but no charges brought, but there was a settlement. Part of the settlement was that, um, and he was murdered under very similar circumstances, that settlement was there was supposed to be, again, sort of training, right, training given on um, uh, the dangers of leaving somebody prone on their stomach under pressure, right, for too long. And now there are, you know, um, uh, you know, document requests going in to see about, you know, what happened in the aftermath of all of this. And so, um, and part of this, um, you know, this is, um, uh, in some ways, comes back to my um, my kind of frustration with the whole area of implicit bias. Is that you know, they, we've been, you know, we've had we've had training, right, of police training of everybody. I mean, everybody here, you know, diversity training, whatever, but we've had training of police for decades. But what we haven't had is accountability. Um, and, um, you know, and, and that's, you know, the idea of um, people paying a price of consequences, consequences and accountability. And again, that's the whole thing, sort of the, um, you know, moving out of the idea of, oh, I, you know, it's just about me and my biases, or just about this one cop and their biases. Um, uh, and and that, uh, that somehow we can have racial progress without pain, right? Without paying a cost, right? That there is a, a bill to come due to pay. And what, um, what sort of the the kind of, I think, the sort of uh, liberal establishment has been telling itself for 30 years is that, oh, well, we can have racial progress without pain, without consequences, without accountability, without cost. All we have to do, I mean, I'm an educator. I totally believe in education. Um, but all we can do, you know, all we, you know, I mean, you know, you know tr put it this way, diversity training is not education. Um, and, um, but also just, you know, there's got to be, um, and, and, and not just, again, consequences for individuals, but consequences for institutions um, that perpetuate this, that perpetuate the knee on the neck, that perpetuate the, um, the steering of people away from certain neighborhoods when they want to buy houses, whatever. Um, and again, you know, it is, it is accountability. And when I say accountability, it's not just accountability for individuals, although that's critical. But again, accountability for institutions, and among the least accountable institutions in American society, you know, right after sort of, uh, um, you know, bank CEOs um, are uh, police departments are just remarkably unaccountable in so many ways. And there's just a bill passed, I think, today in New York saying, oh yes, finally you can have access to past disciplinary records of cops. Right? The idea that these were not, you know, public. Um, you know, it's just, but I mean, but that's, that's been the norm. I know that this space actually, our, our, our meeting today is actually, um, was originally scheduled to have Debbie Ramirez talk about the possibility of liability yeah. insurance, personal liability for, 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 for excessive uses of force, um, to make it accountable in a way that the tort law and generally, uh, you know, it's, 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 um, even when one sues a police department, it, it, you know, it's paid by taxpayers, but it's not actually um, results in any sort of pressure for police departments to, um, um, to have a kind of professional system of licensure and responsibility through insurance. And um, I, you know, I hope um, um, we do um, follow up and, and read her paper and the studies that have been done yeah. by social scientists about the quantitative difference that this might make. Um, in holding to account, as, 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 you, as you stated. Yes, I think there are some very, I mean, I, I think Debbie's paper is a great example of sort of 
creative responses to sort of leverage, um, in particular in that case, you know, sort of le le leverage insurance and law. There are all sorts of different things, you know, ways that um, uh, different mechanisms can be leveraged to um, uh, to to change structure and to change be, you know, to change behavior, um, but not just again. I I don't want to again focus too much on individuals, but but that's a structural right way of dealing with this sort of broad phenomenon. Um, that that's not about again. What's what's good about that model is it's not about sort of getting uh, you know individual whether it's again individual police officers or individual law faculty or whatever to sort of work on themselves right to say oh yes. Oh yeah, I need to work on myself to make myself a better, um, you know, less uh, less biased cop, right, or a less biased law professor. Um, but they're sort of like, you know, I mean, that that's not a bad thing to do. I'm not opposed to that. But it's like it only takes you so far um, in realizing that, well, you know, that there are also, um, uh, again, um, uh, a structure, you know, it, you know, sort of co again consequences for for behavior that transgresses. Um, uh, uh, those norms. Yeah, and as to the normative, I mean, we are living in a moment where we also, one of the checks has generally been the fed, federal civil rights lawsuits. Mm -hmm. And instead we have a, a Department of Justice and a president who says, don't treat them too nicely. So it isn't simply the norm of, um, of uh, th th that starts with uh, the um, that this is a dangerous job and people don't understand the pressures of the job and the and, and but but it is the, the the normative excuse has become better safe than sorry rather yeah. than an ethic of no you were here to protect and to deflate and to and to and to and to um, um, to bring oh. down the pressure and the flames in the street, not to exacerbate it, not yeah. to dominate. I, I, I also recommend for those who have not heard it to read the transcript of the telephone call that the, that the president made to the governors, to all 50 oh. governors. And in that transcript, the president uses the word dominate 18 times. Um, and it's really quite extraordinary um, that that is the ethic as opposed to, yeah. uh, you know, a, a, a you know, the, the, again, the, the, the notion that police serve and protect. And, and it's remarkable in that to think about the ethic involved is also the, the you know, a lot of response to the protest, there's this cause, you know, the, the ethic of nonviolence. Um, and, you know, I'm, you know, an advocate of nonviolence. Um, but it's interesting to think in this model of whom is that ethic demanded? And I think it is good, you know, to, to aspire to nonviolence when you're a protester, but it's never demanded of the state. And think about what would it be like in the context of the responses to these protests, which have been essentially, um, you know, police riots in many respects, right? To demand an ethic of nonviolence from the police. Right from the agents of the state, as we never, you know, and part of this is the idea that oh well, you know, the, the classic definition of the state as having a monopoly on the legitimate use of force or violence, but uh, you know, but just as a way of thinking about you know who are we asking in these contexts to be nonviolent, um, and again, it played against this this language of domination from Trump, um, and the sort of the provocation in these demonstrations of police showing up in riot gear. Right when all the studies show that if you know about de-escalation, you know, works, and that um, you know if you show up, um, even if you need you know want to have want to police these demonstrations, if you you know you know the response of the demonstrators to police in riot gear and shields is just you know, is going to be different from if you're just showing up without the riot gear on and not in massive numbers. Um, it's, you know, there is, it's, again, in terms of like, who, who is, of whom is this ethic of nonviolence being demanded when you deploy, when you deploy military force and militarized police, you are, you are subverting, right? You, you are, um, uh, you, you are provoking, right? You are provoking a, 
a, a violent response or at least a confrontational response. And, and I think it's important to frame this also in, you know, to remember that this was deployed in the context of overwhelmingly peaceful protests. Yes. That's what is so really terrible and frightening about this moment. At the same time, you know, we live in a country where, as you described this, you know, the, the, the monopoly on state force or the monopoly on violence is one that is claimed by the state. But we live in a moment where our polity is overwhelmingly armed and that vigilante forces are growing in a way that really vex the, the expectation that police will be nonviolent in a highly militarized population. And it, these, this moment exists alongside, I think it's a majority of the states now, at least 30 some odd states have stand your ground yeah. uh, uh, laws, which permit the exercise of violence against citizens based on the subjective sense of danger, which seems to be specifically located or particularly located in dark bodies. Yeah. Um, and stand your ground, like the George, like which which tends to be replicated in situations. Although George Jim Zimmerman didn't actually claim stand your ground, but it's the classic stand your ground um, claim that it's reasonable for citizens to use violence to have um, to to be able to claim it in a way um, that then I think um, gives uh, uh, gives a certain complexity. Um, to those images of uh, people with second exercising their Second Amendment rights, marching into legislative bodies with military-grade weapons, um, this is a problem that far exceeds um, uh, the behavior of police and really complexifies, I think, what what it is that we expect of police um, to be able to do. So I, I did hear just recently um, on uh, an interesting um, way to think about sort of defunding and reconfiguring police. You know, what does that look like? What is a de you know what does a community where the uh, police department is being defunded looks like? You know, it, it can mean all sorts of things. But basically, to think of um, and, and you know and, you know there are obviously you know, great limits to this analogy, but you know, limitations to it. But it's, it's with a striking way of saying it is, um, and that, you know, we already have tons of communities where that function effectively as if the police have been defunded. Um, they are largely affluent white suburbs in the sense of imagine, you know, the the type of encounter that the average person in an affluent white suburb has with the police meaning maybe once every few years you, you know somebody is you know you know pulls you over for a ticket or something and that's it you know that's the policing that's happened um and you know there's a police force but it's not an everyday pre presence oppressive presence in your life um uh and I just, you know, it's, it's not, doesn't directly to go, go to what you were just talking about, Pat, but I think it's, um, it is, it is another way of sort of thinking about sort of like where, in a sense, where, you know, that there are these systemic deep rooted problems, but they are also located, right, in different communities, um, in different ways. Um, and that where they are located is itself sort of highly contingent on race and class. In many ways. Yeah, and and I think I think it also goes to the degree to which people don't understand what is meant by defunding the police, yeah. <laughs> so that, for example, there is more money being spent on police officers in New York public schools than there is on guidance counselors or nurses or home interventions for or interventions for yeah. mental illness, which is which is, and, and most forms of mental illness or many forms that begin that last into adulthood, like. Uh, uh, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, begin as young adults. This is the place to have some sort of mental health intervention, and instead, people go straight to jail. Um, in Stockton, uh, California, the, um, uh, the 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 school budget um, uh, there were there were there were actually funds demarcated for bilingual education, but because there are so many police in schools, which is also part of the education department, that 
bilingual education fund was spent on bilingual police dogs in schools. <laughs> that is to say, <laughs> the police dogs could understand Spanish. Um, and that sort of deflection, that's what I think, you know, it's those sorts of examples over and over and over again about the extent to which what used to be other institutions um, that perform social safety net functions in our society, education, mental health, um, yeah. job uh, seeking and so forth, have been deflected and those funds taken and put into policing that we need to rethink. That's, that's part of what is meant by defunding the police, not simply, I mean, that's before one gets to the military surplus that goes into yeah. these departments. So, um, uh, Pat and John, I wanna thank you for a wonderful discussion and uh, reflection. Um, and now to transition over to our uh, student speakers. Hi, um, my name is Simone. I'm a rising 2L. Um, so I think some very good points were made and were raised. I think looking at what has transpired within the past two weeks, and especially we must look at the phrasing that's used. So for example, when all the congressmen and women and senators were on the Hill yesterday, decided to drape themselves in kente cloth and decided to finally propose bills that are addressing racism, but not necessarily in the way that it needs to be addressed. And even within the speech of identifying George Floyd as a martyr, he wasn't a martyr. He was discriminated against and experience the ramifications of racism as expressed through police brutality or otherwise state sanctioned violence. He didn't want to die, he was murdered. And the only reason why we are seeing change is because one, it was filmed, and two of the uprising that have been occurring in all 50 states across this country. It's, we have to be aware of the language that we are using. And it's, it's a shame, it's truly disgusting that while in a pandemic that disproportionately affects Black people because of the pre-existing medical disparities that even within all of this, we still have to fight for our right to live. We have to beg for human empathy, just being a human being, period. And that's disgusting. But it also shows you the remnants of slavery within this country and how this country was and is inherently built upon oppression. There always has to be someone that's oppressed and someone that has the main power. Why is that? What, what is it about blackness or black skin that makes you think we're a threat? And, and it's, just so, it's just so appalling to me. And even, and even looking at what has happened, we have protested peacefully we are not the ones that are inciting violence. It's the police. Why is it that literally like three, four weeks ago, people can be on the state capitol, specifically white people protesting for haircuts and to go shopping and things that are not necessarily essential. And they can have AR-15s, military grade rifles and other weapons, but they're being met with peace. But us on the other hand, when we are fighting for our right to live, we're met with tear gas, riot gear, military grade vehicles, batons. There, as of right now, there are over 400 videos that show, that have demonstrated police brutality at anti-police brutality protests. This, all of these things are happening and there is li there's very small change. I'm glad that Minnesota is taking the initiative to defund police. It's very necessary. As we see in other states, there needs to be the same initiatives taken. In New York, they're putting the anti-choking, anti-chokehold bill, which also has been on the books of not being used since 1993, and was also used to kill Eric Gardner, and his killer is still roaming free. So is all of this performative? Because that's what it seems like. There is no real change. Even going back to what I mentioned earlier about Congress, them taking a knee means nothing. Them wearing kente cloth is actually offensive. So why is it that our legislators that we are voting in decide to do these performative acts instead of actually reforming the system? And also us as law students, law faculty, and just being engrossed within the legal profession, we have a certain amount of privilege because we are in this space. So how are we using our knowledge and our privilege to usher in a change? 
We need to, whether it's donating to bail funds, providing legal services, and truly, under, and truly providing legal challenges to the framework, because what is happening right now is absurd. It's absurd. And so many Black people in this country, whether you were born here, whether you're an immigrant, it doesn't matter because throughout your life living in this country, you're going to have some type of trauma. You're going to have some type of trauma and it's unfair and something needs to be done. Hello everyone, um, my name is Mariah and I just wanna say a few words um, to the Newsle community. Um, as someone who has been part of this Newsle community for two years and seen the drive, passion, and zeal of my fellow stu students, I am hopeful. I believe as, as Newsle students, we are uniquely situated to tackle the injustices that have permeated our society for centuries. Uh, due to our truly unique commitment to social justice and public service through the way in which we are taught and our experiences as individuals. In some, we are a group of passionate people, and I know that in my heart. Activists, organizers, and servants to the under, under, underserved. There is a passion and calling and purpose to serve those who have been left to the wayside. Many of my peers and friends at this school um, have seen this before, any of the recent re events and years before. I feel and sense a collective sense of consciousness I have never seen in mass in an academic setting in my life. Um, and that's just my unique experience. Uh, that's why I think Newsle students can, can try to be and will be the driving force in continuing the movement and revolution because a lot of my, fears, my peers were already moving towards that. Um, towards that end where justice and equality are not just abstract concepts of the world we would love to live in, but a reality. You are all equipped through life experience and now experiences at this law school with the spirit and the motivation to change the world. We just have to do it. And, and, and because an action is, is violence, we have to just do it and act. I'm personally just tired of talking about it I've had many discussions with people even prior to all of the recent events, and I think that inaction is really the violence that we are facing in this country. We already have the tools that we need to have, and we have to just choose to pick them up. They are laid out in front of us and displayed, and we just have to choose to pick them up. I want to echo uh, what Simone was saying, that we just have to pick up the tools that we are privileged with, and all of us in this space have varying tools of privilege. You just have to learn to pick them up. I, for one, am quite frankly over the notion of incremental change. It's always been urgent, always, but the time is now. Not two years from now when we have more pro bono hours to use, not after law school, not when we've gained more skills, but now. Because in the meantime, people are being murdered in broad daylight without recourse. People are being displaced and erased from society and thrown away like they are chattels. So I implore us to all get to work now. At this point, my humanity is no longer up for discussion. If you are looking for things to do to affect and effectuate meaningful, meaningful change, there are a myriad of things displayed on social media and on the World Wide Web that tell you exactly what needs to be done and how you can be part of it. Personally, I'm not going to expend energy to educate because right now my purpose is to manifest and act upon a vision of the future as a Black woman. I can't force any of you to effectuate change and be a part of anything, but I can implore you to check your privilege and figure out what to do with it so that in the end, there is none left. That's what solidarity looks like to me. Let's get organized and let's be intentional. Thank you for your time. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tim Koba. Um, I serve on Boston's e-board as secretary. Uh, firstly, I wanna thank you, um, say thank you to Dean Hackney, Dean Harper, Professor Williams, Professor Khan, um, the Boston advisors, Professor McCoy Dunkley, and, and Lisa Braithwaite, um, fellow Balsa e-board uh, members, um, the IT team, for creating this space and also to, to SBA and all the other affinity groups and student organizations for your continued support and solidarity. All mothers, 
were summoned when George Floyd called out for his, mo for his mama. This message emerged in the wake of George Floyd's death by public torture. Perhaps you've seen it, perhaps you felt it. This spring also bore the murder of a black son whose existence fell prey to the deputized lethal hatred of a white father and a white son while the black son was exercising. This spring bore the murder of a black daughter whose existence fell prey to weaponry wielded by the state with undiscerning court authorized force while the black daughter was slipping into a slumber. This spring, this country wore the despicable brunt of military force upon her citizens at the behest of a commander in chief with a puerile eagerness to escalate. It is true, it is unfortunate that beneath the cloak of law and order lies the American ethos of violence, suppression, dominance, supremacy. It's apparent in American pomp and prose, rockets, red glare. It's apparent in American vernacular. I demolished that burger. I crushed that exam. Pervasive, but nonetheless haunting upon closer look. Apparent in American law enforcement, rampant in American law enforcement, policing of black and brown neighborhoods for generations. The state's monopoly on violence permits and perpetuates the killing of black bodies. Yes, that is grim. But the vicious reality is that this statement is contextualized by 2016 St. Anthony, Minnesota, 2016 Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 2015 Baltimore, Maryland, 2015 North Charleston, South Carolina, 2014 Cleveland, Ohio, 2014 Los Angeles, California, 2014 Missouri, Ferguson, Missouri, 2014 Staten Island, New York, 2012 Stanford, Florida, 1999 Bronx, New York, 1992 Los Angeles, California, 1968 Memphis, Tennessee, 1877 through 1950 Jim Crow South and Acquiescent North, 2020 Glen County, Georgia, 2020 Louisville, Kentucky, 2020 Minneapolis, Minnesota, 2020 Tallahassee, Florida, Although the lawlessness of law enforcement has been normalized and codified throughout history, it seems as though the recent and rapid succession of publicized state brutality finally struck a critical mass with resonant empathy on a global scale. A series of televised lynchings in the year 2020 left our nervous systems in knots. Skeletons shivered, mothers summoned. They tore upon the tethers of dignity, dignity that should have never been up for debate for the past 401 years. Perhaps a critical mass now sees the historical and present day inability to extend the kind of humanity that we extend to white people in this country, to people who are not white. Perhaps a critical mass now understands that the state must stop valuing violence against black and brown humans and instead focus on the flourishing of black and brown communities. It took a series of televised lynchings in the year 2020. The result as of now is still perhaps. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim um, and Simone and Mariah. Uh, for speaking. As it got closer to my name, I, my heart's been getting heavier and heavier. Um, so good afternoon. My name is Bianca Pickering. I am a rising 2L and I'm the social chair on the BALSA eBoard. 
I want to start with a quote from Denzel Washington. Um, Ease is a greater threat to progress than hardship. Comfortability and complacency has left us stagnant and conditioned to accept crumbs towards the right, right direction. It's considered acceptable and often praised, but the standard has risen. For too long, we have tiptoed around the conversation of race, oftentimes trying to make it a comfortable conversation to maintain professionalism. I call what has occurred in the last few weeks divine intervention. It is not a coincidence in my mind anyway, that we are in the middle of a pandemic, that we are stagnant as a country right now. And these videos are not new. In any case, I can watch those videos and no longer feel the same way I felt the first time I saw a black man get killed. So that just shows you how many times I've seen black people get killed on camera. It was meant to be that the world would have to stop and have to stare and have to ask themselves, how much longer? How much many more deaths you need to see? How many times we have to show you, hey, we're being abused? How many books need to be put out that say that we're being abused? It's all there. It's all in writing. It's all on video. It's all in our fears and our microaggressions. We constantly are literally trained to try to infiltrate white spaces just to be heard. Like, I mean, think about that because I think about all of my privilege as well. I am a privilege to be in law school. I am privileged to be in a space like this, to even speak on a forum like this with amazing intellectual individuals. We have about 205 people in this and how many other people won't get to hear these type of words? won't understand that this is so much bigger than anything. Race is an American issue. It's not an issue. It's not one thing. It's, it's expansive. It, it hits everything. So when you make race talk a diversity training, understanding your, you need to understand that you're minimizing that. When diversity and inclusion becomes an optional training, understanding that you're minimizing that. When you have to make sure that there's at least one black person in every class, we're not doing enough. We're not. Um, and this program was entitled What Solidarity Looks Like because the standard has been risen where I'm not teaching. I'm not, I don't think the burden, the burden should have never been placed on us, but yet we carried it so gracefully. We carried that crown gracefully. Um, so most of the people in this room have higher degrees, have master's, law degrees, um, bachelor's degrees. Understand where your privilege sits and see where you can take someone else further. Um, and a last quote that I heard in another um, talk recently is, the burden of being black is heavier, it's heavy. The crown is even heavier, walk accordingly. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Thailand Prabhu Singh, and I serve on the Ball CE board as the academic chair. And in preparation for today, I really took some time to reflect and, and write a piece that I'll share with you all today. I want to first start by saying the pain is real. Last week, I attended a town hall meeting where Ducci, a Nusul and Balsa alum, spoke about how she feels as a black female public defender. 
Today, I share with you some of her words, along with my own personal experience and thoughts. My emotions have been all over the place, but they've mostly ranged from sadness, anger, and rage. Those of you who know me well know that I can generally keep it together and pride myself in taking care of others, making sure everyone is all good and just staying optimistic in the face of adversity. However, this time I just couldn't. Watching that police officer drain the life out of George Floyd for eight minutes and 46 seconds as he yelled, I can't breathe, they're gonna kill me, and mama just broke me. I cried and I've cried probably every day since this happened. I cried because of the harsh realities for black boys and black men living in America. I cried because many just don't get it and it is so emotionally burdensome to try and help them get it. There is also a deep pain I feel when I'm unable to save my black and brown brothers and sisters from being swallowed by the oppressed system. The pain I feel for those who didn't survive. The pain I feel every time black and brown children are pushed out of schools into jails and prisons because I remember the innocent and lovely kids I served in my second and fifth grade classroom who it could have been. There is also a pain of feeling helpless and complicit in the system that was designed to oppress people who look like me. The pain of knowing that this is not an exhaustive list. The pain of just being so tired of it all. And lastly, the pain of knowing that not everyone feels this pain. That for me, it is a very propeller that makes me move with an urgency to fight for justice. But I know I can't give up and give into this despair. I will fight through the tears and pain. The time is now and I'm demanding real change in our legal system, communities, and most importantly, within our hearts. I'm holding everyone around me accountable, including myself. Lastly, I leave you with five things to reflect on. One, think about how someone's beautiful black and brown skin color can be seen as probable cause and as a weapon, whereas someone else's skin color can be seen as their armor, protecting them and privileging them. Two, Think about what it means to embrace human decency. Three, think about how you can make this be a lifelong endeavor and not just a social media post. Four, think about how your future clients are equal to you and should be treated as such. And be so cautious of Saver Complex. We want equal treatment, not special treatment. Five, think about how you can deepen your heart and speak up, but please do not speak for us. I hope this answers the question of what can we do. Thank you. Thank you all for those wonderful words, call to action, giving voice to, I believe what many of us feel. Uh, now we'll hear from the BLSA uh, chair, uh, deny uh, Rosaria. Hi everyone, and thank you for watching for the introduction. And my fear is that so eloquently put forth such hard emotions to even try to convey. Um, the past three weeks have been tough. I've cried, I've marched, I've really gotten any sleep. I've woken up angry nearly every single day. Angry because here we are again. Nothing has changed. Angry because we have to beg for justice and for America to see our humanity. Angry because instead of our pain being acknowledged, it's dismissed. Weeks ago, white armed Americans marched to their state capital to protest the reopening of the economy and their need to get a haircut. Their frustration was understood because they were good citizens that just wanted to resume their daily lives. Weeks later, we marched in anger after witnessing the, witness the modern-day lynching. Nothing has changed. Angry because we have to beg for Justice Ahmed Arbery, the lack of accountability and the killing of, killing of Ahmed Arbery, the last state. But our frustration wasn't understood. Instead, we were labeled thugs and met with tear gas, rubber bullets, and militarized police. Our pain isn't being acknowledged. And that's the point I want to emphasize for you today, the need for acknowledgement. Because the lack thereof has been the core of Black Americans' anger and pain. 
this isn't only about George Floyd and Tony LeBay. But our frustration wasn't under We were about Trayvon Martin, Sandra Bland, Tamia Rice, and that's the point I want to emphasize today. We're from Black Americans in anger and pain. Deanna Taylor. We're so angry about Trayvon Martin eating and raping of our ancestors. We're so angry over the Jim Crow era. We're so angry over the cracks being put into our communities and destroying Black families. We're so angry over mass incarceration, over the redlining. We're so angry over the crap, angry over the devastation of Black Wall Street. We're so angry over the over-policing of our neighborhoods. And we're so angry that the American government has yet to acknowledge the crime against humanity that they committed against our people. And continue so angry over the over-policing of our neighborhoods until the American government acknowledges our pain, until the American government acknowledges the men who are policing our neighborhood that they and makes amends for the crimes they committed against us, opening. While white Americans inher inherited generational wealth passed down by their slaveholding ancestors, we inherited generational trauma. And it's time for a reconciliation. But that can't happen until the American government takes accountability for their crime. While white Americans inher inherited generational wealth passed down by the world, we inherited generational trauma right now. We, and we've been waiting for centuries. So as an ally, especially a white ally, I challenge you to begin taking accountability on behalf of the American government. And before you shut down and think I'm not responsible for what my ancestors did or I haven't harmed black people myself, think about every time you've told someone, I'm sorry that happened to you. And before, or I'm sorry you had to go through that. Or I'm sorry that person made you feel that way when you weren't the perpetrator. I'm asking you today to do the same thing when you're having conversations with your Black friends or your co-workers. Tell us that you acknowledge our pain and our anger, that, you want to, that you're sorry the rest of the country doesn't see it, that you're sorry we're carrying this heavy emotional burden. Tell us that you acknowledge our pain and our anger and continues to try to silence our cries. Now more than ever, we need you to see us and acknowledge us because we have a country trying to invalidate our very pain and anger. A country that tells us to get over slavery and move on as if it's that easy. So please continue to self-educate more than advocate and learn Black history because it's not being taught in schools. Have those uncomfortable conversations with your family members and friends that disagree with our movement. Get uncomfortable. Because for over 400 years, so please continue to disagree with us. It's been uncomfortable to be black because it's not evil. Because for over 400 years, America. So to be an ally is to be uncomfortable with us. Thank you for your solidarity, for being here, for listening to our voices. And if you do consider yourself an ally, know that the fight ain't over yet. And if you do consider yourself an ally, it's going to be a long haul. And we need you to stay locked in with us. It's going to be a long haul. And we need you to stay Thank you. Thank you, Denai. And to all who participated uh, today, uh, this is the beginning of continuing conversations as Denai implored us, often difficult uh, and painful uh, and contested conversations. And we move on and towards steps as was stated by folks today, concrete action steps lead into change. And we do so both within our own institution, within our own halls and outside of those halls. One of the things we've done is to provide folks with uh, opportunities for pro bono opportunities, how we can make concrete steps with respect to effectuating change uh, in the system. Also, over the next uh, week or so, there will be faculty-led discussions that we invite the community to uh, engage with to continue these conversations. You'll be receiving more details uh, about those. Uh, shortly. And over the course of the summer and into the year, and really over the course of our lifetime, we'll have more continued to focus discussion on these issues of racial justice. 
I hope you take advantage of these opportunities uh, to come together, to continue the learning, the engagement, the actions to fight racism, ensure that all members of our society and community in the world are treated with the dignity, equity that we all deserve. Take care and thanks again.